Lord. You are welcome to the presence of God again. Blessed be the name of the Lord who has kept us all alive to this day. May his grace continue to be sufficient for us. In the name of Jesus, let us pray. Our most holy and merciful Father will thank you again because gradually the month of September is moving and we are moving along blessed by God and sustained by his grace. Father, we ask that this grace will continue to keep us and to sustain us in our Christian race, that in all things we say and do, your name shall be glorified. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Beloved children of God, the Lord has prepared wonderful meal for you this morning. Sit back and get refreshed from the gospel of Christ that he is sending into your soul. And as you receive the message of today, the word of God shall do you good. The word will refresh you and renew you. The word will be a strength into your system and open your spiritual eyes to see more and ears to hear the word. And God will grant you the enablement to be able to live your life according to his purpose and agenda in the name of Jesus. Today be the 14th Sunday after Trinity. We thank God that the grace of God is there and is working for you and for your family. We are considering something we call the central theme of the scriptures. What's the word of God stand upon and what we call God himself. And the theme is the most excellent gift of love. The most excellent gift of love. And that is our theme. And we are considering Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 28. The test we are considering today is a very, very popular and common test in the Bible. We call it the Good Samaritan. We are bringing out the teaching of Christ on the meaning and practicalization of the word love from the Bible Jesus gave about the good Samaritan. So I want you to pick your Bible wherever you are, sit back and have a bite of the truth that the Lord has for you this day. Luke chapter 10 verse 25 through 28. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy hearts, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered rightly, Do this, and thou shalt live. Praise the Lord. That is the test. We are considering this test precedes the story Jesus told about the Good Samaritan, the test of today led into what Jesus narrated. The test precedes the story about the Samaritan. This conversation gave birth to the teaching. Something must give birth to something. Some people are in this world to make history. Some are in the world to make news. Some are in the world to make things happen. Some are just in the world to be spectators. Some are in the world to serve God. And some are in the world to bring the best out of the world. Each and every one of us, we are living our lives every day. Whether meaningfully or not meaningful. But it is advisable that the life we are living every day should be meaningful. 
wherever the Lord has placed you, live a responsible and meaningful life. So that someday, somewhere, one day, people will refer to you and talk about the kind of life you lived and what you really lived for. Today we are talking about a Jew, a lawyer, who came to Jesus for conversation. Though the Bible said he came to tempt Jesus, but God used his temptation to teach the world a great lesson about love. And that is the same lesson the Lord is teaching you and me today about the importance of love in the body of Christ. Talking about love is the central theme of the Bible because God himself is love. Love is what millions of people talk about. Or better put, teach and claim, but very scarce to see in practice. When you talk of love, whether agape love, erroneous love, call it whatever, love is something that is so cheap on the lips of human beings. We talk about it every day, every time, anyhow, anywhere, but it is unfortunate that so many people do not know the meaning of love. And the Lord is using the story of Good Samaritan to really teach us the practicality of the word love. Not just in theory, but what you should do, the life you should live, the step you should take that will make people to say, oh, truly, this man is practicing God's type of love. Or well, I call it God-made love because we have a series of versions of loves. Canker warm and a fake love everywhere, destructive and killing love. But we are talking of God-made love, the one that is subjected to the will of God, that has to do with a God that is backed by the scriptures. That is the kind of love we are talking about. When life beats you down, takes away your inheritance and leaves you half dead. Love and compassion should lift you up and bring you back on your feet in good earth. That is what love does. When the life and the world you are living in try to destroy you, love will rescue you and lift you up and bring you back to life. Love is the only antidote to the wickedness and evil permeating our world today. When life becomes painful, love brings hope. When life inflicts injuries on you, love will heal you completely. That is what love does. When life your friends, the society, brings negativity. Love will transform it. Love will change the attack. Love will change their spirits and bring good out of evil. Love is like a transformer. It brings something good out of every negative experience. When the love of God is working for you, Everything negative around your life will turn to good. That is the meaning and purpose of God's love. Christianity is more than a legal or cultural or traditional religion. Christianity is a religion of love. Everything about Christianity has to do with love. The teaching on love as demonstrated in the biblical story of the Good Samaritan is one of the best for our world today because it narrates the practicality of love. That is the value and the importance of the story of the Good Samaritan. You see, we keep on talking about love, 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 theoretical love. We say what people cannot see 
We talk much about love, but in reality, we don't see it. The story of Good Samaritan is telling us how practical you can practice love. What you can do to show that you are a Christian who understands the meaning of love. In the story, it is about conversation between a lawyer who was a Jew and Jesus Christ. The Jew asked a question that only few people in our present generation could ask. And what is that question in Luke chapter 10, verse 25b? He said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said so many people in this generation do not care about heaven anymore. We don't really ask questions about how do I make heaven? How do I give my life to Christ? Just like what happened when Peter ministered in Acts chapter 2, from verse 37 upward, it got to a level that the people shouted, what can I, we do? What can we do? We've heard you. We are broken. The word has penetrated into our lives. And we need to give our lives to Christ. All we see people asking in the church today is miracle, miracle, blessing, money. I need a child. I need husband. I want to build a house. I need cars. I want this breakthrough, success. That is all our world is after. And the church of this generation, that is the only thing they teach. Hardly do you see ministers of God teaching about heaven talking about how people will make heaven, how we are going to <clears throat> drop our sinful life, how we are going to make a turn around, how to live a life that is pleasing to God has become a message that is archaic. It is not as, as acceptable in our generation because our youth are not interested in anything that used to, has to do with heaven. All we are after is this world, this world. And the Bible is saying that the world is passing away. It's going away. We need to talk about heaven because whether we like it or not, that is the last hope of everyone. And for you to make heaven, you need to decide that here before you die. So whether we ignore the message of heaven or we do not ignore it, heaven is real and hell is real. And a good man of God must continue to talk about righteousness, about godliness, about rapture, about heaven, about the second coming of Christ, about how to live our sinful life. We should talk about anything that is ungodly. We should teach people about righteousness of God. We should teach people about sanctification. We should teach our people about holiness, not about tight, about money, 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 money. The teaching of money today has destroyed the church of God. It has taken away the integrity of the church of God. We should stop all these carnal and uh, fleshy messages. Let's concentrate on the soul of our members. It is better to groom people who are heavily conscious that those who are actually conscious without vision and intention of evil. The intention of Christ, the intention of the church is to group people that are prepared for the coming of the bridegroom. May God make us ready and fit for that ministry in the name of Jesus. Just like the man in question, we say many things we don't mean or are not serious about in our hearts. We talk heavily, but we live hardly. What we say and do don't correspond. We are too religious, but scantily Christians. We love to display knowledge. We speak in tongues, attend religious programs, Convention everywhere, but we are shallow in Christian practice. Our Christianity lacks spiritual and godly substance. We make a lot of noise, 
but Christian life is missing. We talk about church, but Christianity is not sin. We have millions of pastors, but sin is on the increase every day. The reason is that what we talk about is not reflected in our lives, in our belief. What we are after is what we take away from Christ. We are not interested in what Christ expects us to do and what Christ expects from us. And that is why Christianity is becoming less effective, less relevant in our world today. The church of God needs to wake up so that the devil will not cut us on our way. We have, we have allowed culture, ethnicity, family and traditions to infiltrate our Christian practice, our traditional mentality, Adamic nature, and inborn character are influencing our Christian life negatively. We have developed a heart of stone against some people that the thunder of the gospel can break our hearts again. To the Jews, the word my neighbor do not include a Samaritan because of tribal and traditional differences between them. To the Jews, nothing good can come from anyone who is from Samaria. How much more Jesus Christ himself you see them as a good example to anybody. That is the irony of the whole thing. The word Samaritan is like a stigma. It's making use of similes, attaching goodness to a Samaritan is like saying a good devil. Can the devil ever be good? To, to the Jews, Samarians are half caste. They are stigmatized people. Jews had nothing to do with them. They believe Samarians are sinners. They should be done away with. They castigate them. They keep themselves away. They don't associate with them. They don't talk to them. They don't relate to them because they believe that Samarians are half caste. They are not people of God. They have been good with God's enemies and they are not original Jews. So because of this, Jews believe that nothing good can come from anyone from Samaria. So they are abhorred set of people. They keep off from them. They don't live, they don't have anything to do with them. So the Jews see themselves as holy people and the Samarians as sinners. How is it today to many of us Christians, to our Christian world, church ego and spiritual pride has killed so many people who call themselves Christians? We have to be very careful. In the church today, we have some people who believe they are the Jews, the most holy set of people, the blessed people, and they see others as sinners, like the Samaritans. Jesus told this Jewish lawyer, learn to love like the Samaritan. That was the last statement of Jesus. In Luke chapter 10, verse 37, he said, go and live your life like that Samaritan. Wow. What's an irony? How can God tell the most only, only person in the world to go and live his life like a Samaritan? Jesus was teaching us something. I hope one day you listening to me, who claim that you are the best in the world, who claim that you can speak in tongues, 
who claim that you are attending Pentecostal Holy Ghost Revival Church, who claim that it is only in your church that God is answering prayers, who believe that you are better than any other person in the world. In fact, some people believe that Holy Spirit is sitting, is living inside their church. It's not in the life of any other person. They are so proud that they don't see anything good in others. Jesus is teaching you something. And what is the Lord saying? He is saying, go and bury your pride today and start learning from ordinary people you think are not up to yourself acclaimed standard. So people you think are not holy will get to heaven before you. Why? They may not be making noise, but they are living rightly, they are living according to the will of God. Enough of noise making everywhere. Come to our church for miracle. The, uh, the blind will see, the lame will walk. We continue to claim things that are not there. Oh, our church alone, our general overseer, is the only one who can take you to heaven. Every other church, they are not church of God. All this pride and ego will not take you anywhere. Because let me remind you, your G.O. and pastor will not be the one that will judge you when Jesus shall come. Judgment belongs to God. That is why as for you should humble yourself and begin to learn from people you think are not making noise, people you think are stigmatized in society, people you think that are not only like you, the Lord is saying, go and learn from them. Go and study their lives. You ask something good to learn from the people you think are nothing by implication. According to our test, everyone you normally consider as your enemy is your neighbor. Can you now pause a bit and ask yourself these questions? Who is that person that means nothing to me? As you are listening to me today, in your heart, who is that person that means nothing to you? Who is that person that you do not like and you know right in your heart you don't like him or her? Who is that person that you don't want to see? Who is that person that you hate his behavior? Who is that person that you have been told, maybe by your mom, but by your dad, or by your friends, that you should not greet? And because they told you not to, you don't greet them in your family. You don't greet them in your community. You don't greet them in your office. Because somebody you respect says so, that you should not greet them, you should not relate to them. And you obey them by ignoring such person. Who is the inherited enemy or the enemy of your friends that you don't greet? You have you develop enmity to some people today, not because the person offended you directly, but because you believe that the enemy of your friend is your enemy. That is what some people say. The enemy of their friend is also their enemy. In the eyes of God, those people you ask something against, they are your neighbor. Love them. And that is the practicality of what the Lord is teaching the church about the good Samaritan. Did those people you think they are nothing, they are useless, they are empty, they are bad, they are, they, they are evil. The people you think does not love you, the people you think are trying to destroy you, go and love the person. Go and show Christ's love to the person. That is what makes you a Christian. That is what makes you a child of God. A good Samaritan is a person who does good, who does good deeds out of compassion and not because of hope of getting reward. When you do something good for others because of God, that is kindness. That is love. But when you do something for others because you want to get reward, you are doing business. You are not serving God. 
That is why you must be careful today. Some people are live a, living a business-like Christian life. They are not living a godly-like Christian life. Every the Christ, Christianity they are practicing is about what they will gain. Some people go to, to a particular church because of contract, because of the big men attending the church, because of uh, musical instrument, because of one thing that has to do with their personal interest. Not because they want to change. Not because they want to give their life to Christ. That is why today, many people tell you that they attend Pentecostal church, yet they still drink beer. They attend Pentecostal church, they still womanize. They attend Pentecostal church, they keep malice. They still, they, they involve in corruption everywhere. When you go to, to our government for status today, those who steal and, and embezzle money, are they not dumb Michael and Muslims and Christians? Those who go to church, who don't care about their conscience, they have lost their integrity. The fear of God is not in their mind. Because people don't go to church again to change, they go to church for their personal enjoyments and whatever they desire from that particular denomination. God is asking you to have a change of mind. If you attend a church for 10 years and you are not living your life like Christ, something is fundamentally wrong with you and i pray your service in the church of god will not be in vain in the name of jesus practice true love like the samaritan shows that true love could be sometimes dangerous very very dangerous sometimes true love is dangerous true love is risky true love will take a lot of your time to practice true love will take a lot of your resources and consume so many things you, 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 that are dear to you. And very often, true love is strenuous. It strains your energy, your strength. It takes a lot from you. By implication, what we are saying is that true love is not cheap. It's not, it's not seen in the life of ordinary people. Love exceeds people you know or anyone who has contributed to your life. Love is beyond that. To love is not easy. To love, as I said, is not cheap. And true love is devoid of sentiment. Love sometimes could mean you lay your life for your brother. John chapter 15, verse 13. How do we practice true love? In the light of the good Samaritan. The, narr the narration is in Luke chapter 10, verse 33 to 35. The practicality, what the Samaritan did, I have about 10 to mention today. Practically, what he did that arose the interest of Christ, that God also want to point by point, number by number to follow. And in fact, it's the best example for you. If you are saying, oh, how do I practice God kinds of love? Go and study the Samaritan. And that is what we want to talk about today. When you look at this, Luke chapter 10, from verse 33 to verse 35, I want to read it from the Bible. Listen to it. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where, or shall I move backward a little bit? from verse 30. And Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which struck him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by 
on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, he came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Now, verse 33. And a certain Samaritan, as he joined, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and burned up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pens and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. That those are the actions what the good Samaritan did that made Jesus fall in love with his life. And the Lord is now saying, study him and do likewise. Let allow me to itemize them. What the good Samaritan did from verse 33. Number one, the Bible says, he saw him just the way other people saw the wounded man half dead on the floor. He saw him. And the Lord is saying to you today, one of the ways to show love is seeing those in need. Some people don't see or they pretend not to see the condition of others. They don't see, or they pretend not to see. No matter what they are going to, what you are going to, they pretend they don't see you. Even when they are told that you are going through challenges, they will pretend they are deaf. They don't see people. They don't. They don't care to see the situation of people. How I wish our our leaders, political leaders. We'll be able to open their eyes and see the, the situation the, the citizens are going through. I pray our religious leaders will look down and see what their members are going through. It is good to have eye to see the condition of others. And when this man, just like others, saw him, what did he do? He had compassion on him. Your boss will say, Oh, do I know? Compassion. He had he has he has eyes of compassion. What do we do today when we see others in pain? We gossip, we judge them. Especially those who are not fortunate or successful like us. We judge them. We forgot that life is not fairly equal. We are, we are not fairly treated in life. It is not everyone who is poor that is lazy. Some people are really working, but things are not working for them. They, are, they, 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 they struggle, but they are just not getting it. Things are not working. So when you see those in pain, God is saying, don't stop judging them. What many of us do today is that when you see people in problem, you begin to judge. When you see a woman who is not married, you judge. When you see a widow, you judge. When you see a boy, a girl is not doing well in school, you judge. When you see somebody who is poor, you judge. Who made you a judge over others? When you see those who are not as good as you are, stop judging them. What you should do is to be close to them and see if there is a way you can help. If there is a way you can assist. If there is a way you can do something to help that person get out of his challenges. Stop judging others. You are not successful because you are the best in the world. You are successful because the grace of God is working for you. Why can't you have mercy on others? 
and do something about people you see around you today and stop judging them. Number three, going to meet them where they are, not necessarily expecting them to come to you. The, one, the, the man went to meet the half dead man where he was lying. He went there to meet him. The wooden man could not even ask for help. Could he speak? A man who is half dead could not have said, Please come and help me. Please. He could not talk again. When you say somebody is half dead, that means he could talk, he couldn't talk, he could not move his body, he could not ask for help. He was helpless. There are so many helpless people in the world. There are many people who are in their need, but they cannot ask you. They are not close to you. Some people are ashamed to talk. Some people feel your, your distance to some people is much that they don't know how to approach you. They don't know where to meet you. They don't have your phone number. Some people are ashamed. During the time of COVID-19, so many people were hungry without knowing how to approach those who have. There are people because of, you know, natural self ego or uh, integrity, begging for money, asking for help is difficult for them. So many people are suffering today, but they are ashamed to talk. Just like this helpless man who could not ask for help. So it takes intelligent people around to be able to know that this brother need help. This sister need help. This woman need help. Let me do something to ameliorate their problem. So there are so many indices, reasons why people may not ask you for help. But the Spirit of God in you should minister to your heart that let me assist the ministry of this pastor. Let me lift him. He may be ashamed to ask me, but the Spirit of God in you should tell you that this is the right thing for you to do. Please, don't be heartless towards those who may need you because God is watching. Number four, the man burned his wound. He burned his wound. What is the implication of this? When you burn the wound of somebody who is bleeding, what happens is that it will stop the flow of blood. You know blood is life. When somebody is bleeding and nobody can stop the flowing of the blood, the person may likely quickly give up and die. But when you stop the flow of blood, then it's a kind of first aid to make sure the person do not die before the person gets to the nearest hospital. So when you stop the flow of blood, then this will stop further complication on the seat, on the sick person. See, some people are already depressed. They are already down. You know, some people are already going through a lot. Their blood is already flowing, wasting. Don't complicate issues for them. Burn the wound of your brother. We are the enemies draining his destiny. Burn his wound. Take him out of depression. If we do this, the, the level of suicide will reduce. The level of people going to robbery, where you see all this kind of fraud going into evil in our society, we reduce. When you move close to people, I burn their wood. You sustain their life, you prolong their lives, and make them fit for recovery. Make somebody recover. Don't kill others with your word, with your language. Don't kill your brother with your evil word. Don't kill them with your silence. When you see people going through pain and you don't do anything, your silence will kill them. Don't kill people with your nonchalant attitude. Don't kill people with I don't care. Don't kill people by ignoring them. Don't keep, kill people by running away from them. Move close to them and burn their wound so that when they come back to life, they can be useful for God and for their generation. 
They mean so you have to be careful as a child of God that God needs you to revive somebody today. Number five, pouring of oil and wine will reduce pain. He poured after he burned his wood, he poured oil and wine on him. We call this spiritual pain relief. You see, when the blood stops flowing, the pain will still be there. You know, the pain is internal. Flowing of blood is external. And if I will cause some internal bleeding, some people are bleeding physically, some people are bleeding spiritually. You need to help them so they don't die suddenly. And when the release of oil and wine is to relieve their pain, to, to ameliorate their pain. Your sweet words, your prayer, your counseling, your visitation, your phone call, your text message, your gift, your financial support can do a lot in the life of someone. It can reduce, somebody said he's hungry and said, you are saying let us pray. Let us pray cannot take away hunger. A cup of rice, a cup of gari, a cup of beans will do more than prayer as at that time. Try to reduce people's pain. Nigerians, people all over the world are in pain. Financial pain, economic pain, pain over their children. So people are frustrated because of the life their children are living in. Re re relieve them of this pain by what you say, by what you do. Don't kill people before their time. Show them love. Tell them that God is good and let them see the reality that truly God is good. Number six, he put the wounded man on his beast or camel. He put the wounded man on his beast or camel. The theology of this is that in Israel, as at that time, two people do not climb a camel at the same time. That camel was privately for this man of, to aid his journey. So for him to help this wounded man and put the man on his camel, the camel, the implication of this is that the man himself must trek. Because two people cannot climb a camel at the same time. You can see the way this man inconvenienced himself to help somebody. You can see the way he brought himself down to lift somebody up. When you learn to lift people up, you will never go down in life. Learn to lift others up. To love most times means you will inconvenience yourself. To bring people into your home, to carry people in your car, to lend people money, to give them sometimes, some people will ask you what you don't even have. To be able to help them, you need to inconvenience yourself. Out of the money you are saving for something else, give out to help people. God knows how he will reward you. Number seven, he took him to where he will be treated better, to an hospital. He took him to a clinic. There are many things you can you can't do alone, but you know where someone can get help. Don't hesitate to do it. In Mark chapter four, five, the Bible says this paralysis man was at home; he could not talk, he could not walk, and they knew Jesus was in town. What did they do? They took him to where he would get healing. They could not heal this man, but they took him to Jesus. They know if they take him to Jesus. He will be healed. Do you know what happened? When he got to where Jesus was ministering, it was in a building. The place was already filled. They couldn't, they didn't know what to do. They had to go on top of the roof. They removed the roof and laid the man down from the roof in the front of Jesus. The man could not help himself, but he was surrounded with good people. You can imagine a single man in problem. And four people were available to help him. So those who were help, ready to help, were more than the man who is having, you can see ratio four to one. Today, 100 people in need, they don't even have two people to help them. 
We now have very little people, having very many people in need. That is not helping our society. When God has blessed you, you there, there are people you can link out. You can link up somebody who's looking for a job. You can make a phone call to say, please, he needs help. There are some people who have worked in many churches where a man is poor, but he has friends who is rich, who are rich, and he, he will begin to link the church with godly people who are rich to help the church of God to grow. You have contact. What are you using your contact for? You know the president. Are you using that opportunity to help your community? You are a friend to the richest men in the world, yet your family is not getting help. You are a friend to the governor. You are useless. You are a friend to the president. You are not useful. You have phone numbers of senators on your phone, yet nobody's getting a job in your family. You are a useless man. You have contact of successful people in the world, yet you are not helping anybody. You are a useless man. What is the essence of your life? If you have all this contact, you know all these friends, you are close to this, you are close to that, yet nobody is getting palliative to, to help them, to help lift them. No student is getting scholarship. You are a medical doctor, first class medical doctor, there is no single clinic in your village. You are useless. You are a professor in the university, there is no good school in your town. You are useless. You are just having a big name, but useless life. The Lord is talking to you to change today. You are not just what you are for yourself. Make an impact, do something, connect somebody, take them to who will give them job. Take them to the hospital. Buy drugs for them. Help somebody. Help that guy get a job. Secure something good for him. Make this life better for others. And God will be happy at you. That is what the Lord is saying. Concerning you today, he took him to where he will get it. Number eight. He did not dump him there. He was sure the man was treated. Have care is no care at all. It is not enough to tell someone God bless you. Be the blessing. Don't say how is school. Support the person's education. Don't be fake in your show of love. Be practical. The man was sure he's, he stood there. He made sure that he got it. Don't just give people complimentary card. Make some follow-up. Find out if he met the man. Don't just say, come and see me. Make sure your phone number is available, it's reachable. You ask me to come to Abuja to see you, yet the person got there, he could not reach your phone. Do a follow-up, make sure. Don't just say, do go there. Make sure what the person is looking for is able to get it. That's what the Lord is saying. And number nine, he stayed with him till the next day to be sure that the man was stable. The Holy Spirit told me something. You see, it was not possible for this Samaritan to really get the story of how that man got into trouble when he was half dead. You see, there are things you will not understand about people when you are far away from them or when you move to where, when you move close to them for just one day. But when you take time to allow them to recover, you will discover stories about them. The, the, that wounded man will have used that opportunity to narrate his story to the Samaritan. This is what happened to me. That is after he has recovered. He was able to get the true story of what led to that situation. Maybe of how many people attacked him, what they took away from him, where the man was really traveling to, where he's coming from, it will give him time to hear him. Maybe the wounded man was even richer than the Samaritan. He didn't know. But he wouldn't know this until he has recovered. That was the only time he could hear and say, oh, Sir, what really happened to you? Before people can tell you their story, they must have trusted you. They must have seen you as a friend. Before they can narrate their life to you, 
They must have been sure that this is somebody responsible. This is somebody reliable. Visiting some people, taking time to sit with them, to talk to them, when they have recovered in life, can give you the opportunity to hear their story. This will bring trust and this will aid the advancement of their healing. That is what the Lord is saying. And number 10, he paid the hospital bills, promising to come back again to attend to further expenses on the man's earth. Healing takes time and very costly too. What people go through are not the same and the process of healing can't be the same. Some people need more than fire brigade attention to get complete recovery. You really need to come back. Some people need you to come back. Some people need you to come back. Those who are giving up of others, come back. Those who are saying you will not help again, come back. If you are saying, I, I cannot assist anybody, the Lord is calling you back to what you have started, the good you have started, complete it. The, the beginning is not the issue. You must run your race to the end. What a life. What a service. What a dedication. What a selfless life. You see, there are some things you need to learn as a lesson from this. Number one, when someone needs help, give him. When your brother or your sister need help, give them. Having the intent to help is good. But acting on that intent is much better. The Samaritan intent didn't save the wounded man from dead. It is his action that ultimately saved the man's life. He didn't walk away like others. He decided to do something. Please do something today. In our time, that half dead man will have seen people taking his pictures and places on social media. That is what we do today. We gossip. He put their few, you can imagine people having accidents. More than 20, 30 people die and people are taking a picture, putting it in the social media. Nobody is even going there to carry them to be sure if there are people that can be saved. Number two there. Race should never matter. Sentiment. I don't deal with them. Samaritan Jews. When you want to love, love whoever is around you. Whether you're, it's your friend or your enemy. Whether your tribe don't greet their tribe. Whether the issue of xenophobia will not come up. Racism will not come up. It's a Muslim and a Christian will not come up. It's a redeemer and I'm an Anglican will not come up. When you are a Christian, everybody is your friend. Everyone is your brother. You love everyone, even those who are your enemy, you still love them. And that is the teaching of Christ. And the Lord is saying, and that lesson is that, be kind, even to your haters. In Matthew chapter 4, it says, love, chapter 5, 45, 45, love your enemies. He didn't say, hate your enemies. Love those who hate you. Love them. Those who hate you, love them. That's why Martin Luther King Jr., Say something about this good Samaritan. He said, on the parable of the good Samaritan, I imagine that the first question the priest and Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But by the very nature of his concern, the good Samaritan reversed the question. If I do not stop, to help this man, what will happen to him? You can see. It's not about if I help him, what will happen to me. It's not you, it's him. If I do not stop to help him, he might die. That is considering others more than yourself. Consider putting yourself in the Samaritan's shoe. What would you have thought of first? The fact that he is from a different race, or that he is dying and needs help. Somebody needs help, you are saying, it's not my family. We are not from the same church. What is your business with that? Uh, will you use it well? Is that your business? 
Do what God asks you to do, and the Lord will reward you. Help without expecting something in return. That is Christian attitude. Help people. Don't expect anything in return. God is looking for a man to set an example of godliness and righteousness in this wicked and greedy generation. Will you be one? That is what the Lord is asking me to tell you today. Start with little acts of kindness and practice more empathy. Think less about what others can do for you and more of what you can do for them. That it in itself is already been a good Samaritan. Learn from those you think are not as holy as you are. Open your eyes and mind and ears to learn good things from your surroundings and live the kind of life Christ would have lived if he is in Nigeria, if he is in your family, if he is in that country where you are living. Live like Christ and your reward shall be great in heaven. May God bless you as you make that good decision today in the name of Jesus. I want you to like this message, subscribe to it, send it to your friends, and use it as, a, as an instrument of winning souls, and heaven will reward you for this in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, we thank you because you have opened your heart to us again. What we should know and what we should do. If only we want to live our lives in conformity with your will. You have opened our eyes to the lessons to how to practicalize love. You've shown us it is now left for us as we have heard the gospel to live according to your word and become better Christians so that our world will become a better place. Give us the grace, O Lord, to be ready to live according to your word, to love our neighbor, to love that enemy, to love that man we never loved, to love that woman, to show affection and empathy to those who are going through pain and agony, so that we shall we reflect the likeness of Christ into them. And this will in turn bring them back to the Lord and make them live their lives like Christ. Do this for us and make us obedient Christians in all we say and do through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you.